for those of you who don't know what the Bridge Club is, Brenda, my uh, beautiful partner, do you want to jump in and, and kind of give that little background? Yeah, I mean, we have such a, a group of people on so far who really are not familiar with the Bridge Club. So Catherine Haskins, Catherine, and I started the Bridge Club um, really to connect people together. We have a huge affinity for bringing people together and for really helping people learn and to grow. So we thought, wow, let's make a little business out of this. So, um, so we started that really to connect various people with a common interest in some of these educational topics we're bringing to the table. And we envisioned it as a place where you could kind of feel like you're having a conversation with your very best friends. So we bring in the TED Talks part of it with our host. And then we have the LinkedIn part of it because of the connections you can make with people who show up. And then there is that, you know, good old club where people can have very honest and authentic on a platform where we get to see each other and watch each other's expressions and, you know, have those conversations so we're not just attending a webinar or anything like that. So you kind of cut out there. Did anyone else get her cutting out? Yeah, a little bit. Did, did I? Okay. okay. All right. Well, I'm just going to keep going and because you haven't missed that much. Um, <laughs> we do things a little bit differently around here at the Bridge Club. Um, number one, we need to make you all aware that this session is being recorded. We do archive um, all of our online sessions and our all access members do get access to the recordings after the fact if they want to revisit a conversation for that, okay? Um, second most important, or actually the most important, but the second thing is that we really want you guys to engage with the conversation. And you'll note that Halal has several places, you know, as she's talking with us where she will invite you to do that. But please feel free to speak up. If you don't want to raise your hand, um, you can use the chat function and we will ask your question for you or make your comment for you. So there is that option. Um, thank you for turning on your video camera because this really is about engaging and interacting with each other. And it's hard to do that when we're hidden behind something. So um, the more we can see your fabulous faces, the better it is for everybody. So truly appreciate that. And the most important thing of all is this is built around beverages. I'm on location, so I don't have my Bridge Club mug. But mm -hmm. um, we start every session with a toast. And I would like to invite now um, our guest host today, Dr. Halal Dogan, to give us a toast and start the conversation. Halal. Thanks, Brenda. And thank you, Catherine. I just want to give a toast to uh, rebuilding our future and restructuring our dreams because sometimes our dreams aren't exactly what we thought they would be. So here's to start <clears throat> over. Cheers. Cheers. Here, here. Oh, that was a big down wall. Yeah, that was. Well, she is drinking whiskey for heaven's sakes. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I might as well just do the whole thing right now. Anyway, so my name is Dr. Hilal Dogan, and I graduated from Massey University in New Zealand about three and a half years ago. And shortly after graduation, I moved to Hawaii and I practiced on the island of Maui, and I also did a lot of relief work on Oahu and a little bit in Maui after being in private practice for about two years. And it was when I was in private practice that I definitely, re actually it was when I even first started or I even went into the private practice I was in when I, I started with relief, basically. And, um, I just saw the disillusionment of the dream really early on, and I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, is this it? Like, this is what I signed up for, because I was also a tech, a vet tech in the United States before I moved to New Zealand, so I thought I knew the industry really well. So I guess my question is to you all is... Um, do you ever feel that way when you're at work, or are you currently in that position right now? We know one person already is, but um, so if you just want to raise your hand, if you are, or if you've ever felt that, I see Crystal kind of nodding. And sure, yeah. Yeah, a little bit, even if it comes and goes. Um, mm -hmm. It's not always the feeling you have, but there could be this underlying and I see a couple other head nods. I'm just looking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess that's why we're all here today. 
to discuss this. And um, I just remember when I started the Veterinary Confessionals Project when I was in vet school. And for those of you who don't know, it's an anonymous art project where we can confess our secrets or stories and be fun or happy or sad. And I remember one of the secrets when I was feeling this disillusionment was from another uh, veterinarian who was afraid to leave the practice they were at because they felt that it was just going to be the same everywhere they went. And that was actually what my practice manager told me when I told them that how I was feeling because I felt it was important to be honest and share my feelings. And he basically was like, oh, well, it's going to be like this no matter where you go. You know, it's not us, it's you. And I just found that really hard to believe, especially because I didn't want to give up on, you know, the idea that it can get better and maybe this just isn't the right place for me. Maybe he was right on some level, but also wrong at the same time. So basically from there, I'm just wondering if anyone wants to, you know, pitch in either in the chat or just vocally, you know, a brief, like just one or two sentences of where you're at, just to share with everyone. If not, that's okay. But I just want to open it up to that before I continue. <laughs> I, I could go, sorry, yeah. I, this is George Berman and I apologize. I'm on my phone because I'm driving. So I don't get the benefit of everyone's faces, which is very sad to me. Um, but I did want to say that, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate. I'm in a very unique position because I came from the business world and uh, left that to go into vet school. And yeah, certainly reached that point of like, oh my gosh, why did I do this? You know, why did I give up my cushy five day a week, Monday through five, Friday, six figure salary career so that I could work harder and get paid significantly less? Um, for me, I've, I have really come back to be more in the business world, but I have found um, my joy and passion and revitalization through um, helping veterinarians in this exact situation to improve their lives. Um, so, you know, because I found my way to do that, and I think it's important that every every graduate and every veterinarian can find a way to feel passionate about what they do. Wow, yeah, thanks, Joy. That's really great to hear your story, a little snippet of it. And yeah, I'm here today to just share a little snippet of my story and basically how I re-energized my dream of being in this industry and how I did end up finding my place and I'm still finding my place. But I just want to let you all know that sometimes it can feel like really soul crushing and that this is just the way it's going to be forever, but it's definitely not forever. It's really about a finding your self awareness, like really asking yourself, what is it that I want to be doing and what is it that I'm good at doing in this profession? Because there's just so much you can do. And I know it sounds cliche. I know a lot of people say that, but it really is true. And I did think about giving up, but then there was just this part of me just knew that I loved some of the interactions I had with the clients and their animals. And I knew I didn't want to fully give up clinical work. And I knew I was good at relief because I'm just someone who's really flexible and I like variety and I like working with different people. And I just moved from Hawaii to Denver about four months ago. And I just started doing relief work. And I'm not going to say there aren't stresses that come with relief work. I mean, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> there's definitely anxiety around that too. But I think it's just accepting like, okay, before I go into a new clinic, I'm going to have some anxiety. But at the end of the day, the past couple relief shifts I've done, for instance, I felt exhausted, but I just felt so good. You know, like that good kind of exhausted, like you really feel like you made a difference and you really helped these people and the animals that you were working with. Because there was a point in time where I didn't feel like I was helping the people or the animals. And I just was like, what am I doing? You know, so I'm slowly finding my place and I'm definitely 
not ready to give up. And I'm not saying you shouldn't give up or you should give up. What I'm saying is that you really need to give yourself permission to explore. So if that means, you know, like you said, Nayantara, how you were thinking of maybe applying for a job still in the industry, but maybe not clinical. Yeah, I would say you should go for it because if you don't give yourself the permission to try these new things, like for instance, I love doing relief right now and I'm working in the industry with conferencing and everything. So I feel like I'm achieving that work-life balance without totally giving up on my dream of being in the profession. And I'm just here to say that I think that's possible for everyone and even if that means leaving the profession for a little bit just to go explore other options and then maybe coming back and so nothing is just set in stone and i'm just here to say that i think everyone should give themselves the permission to do that to explore and to really figure out who you are and what you enjoy doing mm -hmm. so um do we have any questions right now or any other anecdotes people would like to add? You know, I'm pretty sure we've all experienced some of the same stress levels that you have in, in different fashions, but I'm sure all of us, uh, we're right there with you. Yeah, and one of the other things that I really like to talk about that I just want to raise awareness on is, which I don't feel like we really talk about in vet school, is like the secondary trauma that we experience when we're witnessing a lot of stress and trauma, not only in our patients, but our clients. So when I learned about secondary trauma, and I don't have time to get into it right now, but I would suggest if you're interested to just look it up, it's also known as vicarious trauma. And it's how we take on the stress and the trauma through observation, because our brain is wired to feel those emotions and feel those feelings. And if you're not aware that that's what's happening when you're at work, which they don't talk a lot about the subject of veterinary medicine, but they do talk about it a lot for paramedics and human medicine because psychologists understand how humans relate to each other better than they understand animals. So that's another thing that I learned about in the past couple of years that has really helped me realize why some of the days I feel really worn out has to also do that, has to do with that. So it's kind of multifactorial. It's not just one thing. It's not just a toxic practice or a toxic boss or toxic coworkers. We do talk about that a lot as well with DBM 360 and the, at the conferences, but sometimes it's your own emotional needs and your own emotional stress that you're going through or not knowing where you fit in. And so we're just here to raise awareness about the different multifactorial effects of being in free practice. And I think that's one minute Catherine is saying. No, no, I'm actually, uh, I, have a, yeah. I have a question for you. We're doing, we're doing good on time. My, okay, my question is, you know, how do you, how do you address when, like exactly where some, someone is, if they're like, do I, do I stick it out? Do I try to make it better? Uh, do I, you know, leave? Um, you know, some people have an, an, an empirical point of them where they're just very resilient no matter what. This isn't for me. I'm going to cut bait. I'm out. But for others, there's this need to fix or maybe this is the way it's supposed. Like when you hear from a boss that says or the owner of a practice that says, get used to it. This is the way it is. And you go, oh, like what would you... For that, it's a pivotal moment, right? It's when did you decide this is my shift or how can someone else go, this really sucks, this isn't what I wanted and so I shouldn't like stay on that path. I'm just trying to, so we can help others when they get to that pivotal point. Yeah, well, for instance, when I was in private practice in Maui, I was at the beginning, I was trying to chalk everything up to, you know, being a recent grad and only being a year out and the stress of that. And I was like, I just need to work on myself and I need to work on my, you know, positivity and just, I'm just going to walk into work and be really positive and everything's going to go great, you know, and I tried that for a while. And yeah, it works temporarily, but then I just realized I got to the point for me, it was where I just was like dreading going to work every day. And it wasn't the type of anxiety before like a relief shift. It was like, 
I know I'm going to feel crappy even at the end of the day. Like, I'm just going to feel terrible. And I, it came, I hate to admit it, but it came to a point where I was like crying on my way to work because I just hated going there so much. And this was a clinic that when I initially started, I loved it. And I did 24 hour shifts. I was on call regularly. And for me, it wasn't like the workload. I love working and I don't mind being on call, but it was actually just the toxicity of the practice in that instance. And probably for me, just not being in the the right place that was ideal for me. So I even made a voice recording for myself just to tell myself, like, remember how crappy this feels and you need to get out now. And I researched all this information about how to quit, what's the right way to quit. And all the information I was finding was saying, oh, have a financial cushion and have a backup plan, like have another job ready. And I didn't have any of that. I just was like, I need to get out now because this is for my own mental health and my own sanity. And if I, I can't trust that, I mean, I had a little bit of side income from writing, but that was like $300 a month. So not really that much, but I just was like, I'll figure it out. I just need to save myself. So I think I had let it go a bit too far. And I would say if you already are feeling like where you're at is toxic, then I would say start formulating an exit strategy. And a lot of people will say have another job lined up, but I didn't and I survived and <laughs> I just, that was me. That's my story. I don't know if that helps answer Catherine, your question. No, it does because I think what's funny is I think, and it's funny when you said, I'll go in with positivity. And it's funny how we think we can force ourselves to be happy, but we're not. And I don't care what the career is. If you're in a bad environment and it's not good for your soul, that's the very first place we go, right? It's our fault. We're coming in with the wrong attitude. Mm -hmm. I can't even tell you how many times I've done that in my jobs of like, I'm just going to be happier. And I do the same thing. I've come home and I've cried and I've gone to work crying. So I think you really hit on it. I'm not the only one then. No, you're not. You're not at all. Halal, you, I mean, you've taken some very proactive steps that I think are not easy for some people to do, right? And even if you look at the psychographic profile of people who choose to become veterans, and when you think about how competitive veterinary school is, I mean, do you feel like you come out of veterinary school um, with an expectation that is too high for the reality and that contributes to it or do you think it's more individual? what in your experience have you found through that confessional project um for well one of the reasons i started the vet confessionals project was because i realized the importance of community and i think i don't think it's like that vet schools don't prepare us i don't want to blame necessarily that because there were definitely days and nights where we just we're on 24 seven working our butts off and we were exhausted and you know things were difficult but it was for me at least the community that I had at my school with my classmates in New Zealand um, I definitely felt like a huge lack of that huge lack of it in Maui in Hawaii on um, we all went our separate ways and I talked to my classmates still and they also have had similar feelings to me so I know I'm not alone like they've shared stories of their own struggles right now a couple of them are in England and uh, some other ones I know are in the states and New Zealand and we're all kind of going through the same thing and in terms of like this disillusionment so I don't and we're all very different people but I think it's just you have such a strong community when you're in vet school and then you come out and if like they did try and tell us like go to somewhere with really great mentorship and it's like yeah we can't all go somewhere with really great mentorship and it's also the clash of you know the different generations and the different types of practice and there are still many things you're not prepared for but they also do tell you that in vet school like sometimes it felt like a joke, but they would say, we only really prepare you for 10% of what you're going to have to deal with when you're, you know, but uh, you don't really know until you're out there what they're talking about. So. Wow. I am curious because we do have uh, Stacy, and I don't mean to put you on the spot here, Stacy, but Stacy is the vet recruiter. I'm just curious. Do you hear this a lot? Oh, turn it on. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Can you yeah, hear me? we can. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Yes, um, sadly I, I do. You know, we talk with hundreds of veterinarians a month all over the country and also outside of the United States too. And um, this is something that we're hearing um, more often. Um, tomorrow I'm doing a webinar for the AAIV, which is American Association of Industry Veterinarians, uh, talking about the skills needed in industry for veterinarians who are interested in getting into industry. And someone asked me yesterday, they said, are there lots of job opportunities available in industry? And from what I'm seeing, um, I said to them, I don't know that you want me to say this on the call tomorrow, but I'm actually not seeing as many opportunities in industry right now as I have in the past for veterinarians because of all of the consolidation. In fact, I'm talking to veterinarians that are getting displaced. Um, you know, I talked to one this week because her company bought another company and they had to lay her off because they didn't need her job anymore. And so on the practice side, there's so many job openings and there's one veterinarian for every five job openings in practice. And sadly, I talk to many veterinarians every week that don't want to practice in practice. They want to go to industry. So there's not as many job opportunities in industry as there are um, in practice. But like you were saying earlier, um, sometimes it's just changing your setting. It's not necessarily, doesn't mean that you're never going to find a position in practice. It just means you probably weren't in the right culture. You weren't in the right environment, but changing and going to a different environment that shares your values and is more of a cultural fit for you, you can be much happier. But some veterinarians think, well, I just don't want to practice, so I'll go in industry and go do something else. And that's not always um, the answer, too, because sometimes they don't realize, for example, in industry that they're, they're traveling extensively or that they're working on weekends to go to trade shows or that they actually put in more hours um, as an industry veterinarian in practice. They think it's a cush, easy job, but it's, it, it's not. And uh, so I don't think just... Um, you know, saying I don't want to practice anymore is the answer. I think it's just let's find a practice that's going to better fit you. That's Great. really good. I appreciate that. Interesting commentary, too, on less jobs in industry, because for a long time it seems like there were, it was burgeoning, but really good commentary on what the consolidation has done. So I, I want to, I mean, I don't, I have, a, I have another question, but I want to send it out to all of you in the audience. Any questions or thoughts that have popped up to toss into the conversation here? Well, I was, I was just going to point out that I think that the switch to industry is probably less about, well, to, especially to new graduates, it's less about the idea of um, kind of getting a cushier job or anything, but it kind of goes back to what you were saying before is the emotional, the, the emotional baggage that comes along with it. At least you, you might work longer hours, but I don't know that that, I mean, everybody always says that's the big problem is millennials don't want to work or things, and I don't ever see that. But I think that it's just mentally trying, and that's the part that we're not really preparing veterinarians for. I mean, it's, it's a lot of, of crushing. You're always self-doubting. Most of the time in pra general practice, you never get the right answer or the answer in general. And so it makes it much more difficult. Whereas in veterinary school, because it's a tertiary institution, we almost always get the answer because people want to know. So whether it's a, at, at necropsy or things of that nature. So I think that's probably a little bit of that shift of people saying, oh, I want to go into industries because at least then they know what their job entails and they feel like they can tackle it on a day-to-day -day basis rather than when you're, in, when you're uh, in the general practice or even when you're in specialty practices. Like when I'm a radiologist, my best interactions are when I actually have somebody call me back and say, hey, you're right, or even, hey, you're wrong, but not having that kind of dread that over the course of a month, you may never know what any of these animals ever had or whether you did right or wrong. Yeah, that's definitely really true, Tony, because just yesterday when I was at one of the relief work clinics, I was just, I had to do three euthanasias in a row and they were apologizing. I'm like, oh, we're so sorry your day started out like this. And I was like, no, this is great because it's very final and I know, you know, this, job is done like I know yeah it's sad and they were all 15 year old animals and everything and they needed to go to heaven but yeah I do agree there's also some of that just like never really knowing sometimes what the answer is well especially as a relief vet I mean you kind of fly in and you have to fly out and you probably never even get follow-up so you're just happy if they survive the day <laughs> yeah or like I got one a radiologist review back for a cruise ship the same day we sent it out like we sent it out in the morning and then they're like oh yeah this is a cruise ship dog and 
I was just so happy because I'm like, wow, I got an answer. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, Nayanthara has a, a question. Um, it's less of a question and more of a bit of my story. So basically, I was a shelter vet for two years in Botswana and Southern Africa. And then, um, and then I moved to Dar es Salaam, Tanzania to work. Um, so I was working in private practice for the last six months alongside, um, and there's a shelter associated with it. And the irony over there was that the lady, the owners, the shareholders of practice and the owners of practice were not veterinarians. And uh, my colleague was a Tanzanian colleague. And I, I mean, I left under the worst circumstances ever because six months into working, they changed my contract. They pulled me off my original contract. I have not received compensation over time since I started working in October. So I worked through Christmas and everything. And I told them that when I came that I was tired because I'd been on call for a year and a half before joining this practice. And then I continued being on call. I tried to set up systems and policies and everything to say, well, we have two veterinarians and a vet nurse. It's a, working in Africa is extremely different to working possibly in the West where at least you have other veterinarian practice. We were a city of 4 million people with two veterinary clinics. That's it. So basically anything emergency used to come my way. I didn't have an extra machine. I didn't have an ultrasound. I didn't have referrals. I didn't have specialists, nothing. And I worked all the time, you know, it was, it was killer. And I had a Tanzanian colleague who would make really basic mistakes. Like just before I left, he injected a dog that he had put on creds for a skin infection with, uh, with NSAIDs, you know, and stuff like that. And that would freak me out because you guys are talking about not seeing what happens to your cases. I would be freaking out because I, I was not the practice manager. I was not running the practice. I could do nothing about these kinds of things. Despite the fact that for me, this was really bad medicine. And, and if I went to the practice owner and I said, look, I mean, how do you even tell tale on a colleague like that? Because the, not, not, no one above me was a veterinarian. So I was always in this position of being like, oh my God, that's such bad medicine being practiced and not even having a reporting body or anything to do it with. And then in the end, the owner of the practice thought I was trying to take over the practice. And then she uh, changed my contract so I could be fired at will without cause or notice, which is illegal in Tanzania. Yeah, <laughs> this was the last month of my life. So finally I said, enough. So I left and I just, I said, okay, I'm going back home. I need a break from all of this. But basically to say that even in other parts of the world, things are even worse for veterinarians sometimes, you know, in the sense that um, just in case any of you are having a bad day, that was the story of my life the last couple of months. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's with us sharing that. That's, uh, that's wow. Yeah, that's pretty terrible. I mean, and that's just one experience with this veterinarian of I don't know how many. I mean, another experience was the fact that we had, we had clients, international clients who wanted to move the animals, say, back to the EU with them. And the, one of our animals failed a rabies titer test. And I kept asking him, I said, you have to look at the clinical history and see why an animal's failed a titer test. You can't just revaccinate the animal. Have you done, have you checked up why? And then he just didn't care. And then finally I went through the clinical history and found out that the last time he vaccinated the animals, the animal, he had been treating it for Demodex mange. So the animal had been immunocompromised. So even though all of us talk about vaccine eff eff um, efficacy and everything else, the animal actually didn't reach the rabies titer levels. It needed to move back to, the, to Europe. And they're really strict in Europe. And I said, well, you vaccinated an animal that was immunocompromised. I mean, that's like lesson one in not vaccinating an animal. And now you've cost that client like, I don't know, $500 in vet fees between the blood draws and the, we had to send the blood to South Africa for titer testing and all of this. And I said, I don't even think he even grasped the enormity of what he had done. You know, the fact that the animal would not leave Africa in two months when the owners left back to the EU and they had to leave their diplomats and stuff like that. You know, I just, I could not deal with that kind of stress where it wasn't even my responsibility anymore, but just the fact that I'd wake up every morning and be like, oh my God, what's going to go wrong today? Well, yeah, I mean, that's a lot of ethical stress and definitely um, I've experienced that too, especially with the island medicine in Hawaii. Um, but even my friends in England, some of the practices that they're at in London, it's really scary. So that's another factor is like the ethical stress of what we're doing, not only for animals, but, you know, the rest of the world i mean we're all interlinked and like that's what i love about the bridge club is that they do want to have an international reach and my background is very international like i was my father's a diplomat so i traveled my whole life and 
you know, so it's definitely your, you might take the cake on the worst month ever, probably <laughs> right now. But I mean, it's still very valid here as well. And the great thing, I guess, about these now the internet and sharing a community like this is that um, the problems are not necessarily that different. And that's what I'm seeing with the Vet Confessionals project as well, which started in New Zealand and has international reach is, you know, we all deal with these stresses, some more extreme than others, for sure, like a 4 million person community with only two vets that I can't even imagine. That's awful, yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, we just right here. So we have reached, and hold on, hold on, just two seconds, just two seconds. Um, we are at the end of our 25 minutes, and we promise everyone that at the end of 25 minutes, if your schedules do not allow you to stay, you are more than welcome to jump off. Um, however, I alluded earlier in the um, evening to the after party. So if anybody is interested in hanging around a few more minutes to continue this conversation, please do. Halal is able to stay with us for a little bit and um, there might be more discussion to be had. So if you must say au revoir right now, go ahead and do that. With or our I would say if you have to get a refill for those of us who actually, you know, follow the rules. I got a refill. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming. Yeah, so anyone who asked to leave, if you had any part, in, you know, any, any thoughts, and then we will continue on for a few minutes more. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Sadly, you know, I hate to always inter interrupt and we're on a roll with good conversations like that, but we want to keep true to our promise for those people who can't hang around. So, so I will say that those who don't have their photos on have also sent me private messages that they do have a beverage. So uh, that's good to know, just in case anyone was curious about that. I will know for next time. <laughs> there you go. Um, and Stacy wants to add something. She had a comment she wanted let's to add. Carry on. Anybody who has to drop off can, but let's carry on. So, yeah, I just wanted to say that there is a, there's a disconnect that I see sometimes between employers and their expectations and um, employees, and I see that in my own search practice. I have clients that I think have unreasonable expectations of people, and I, I try to bridge that gap and you know, bring that uh, employer and that employee together um, when I'm placing somebody. But you know, just to give you an example, I have a client that uh, they're vet the veterinary practice, they own multiple veterinary practices, and they were hiring a veterinarian, and they were expecting her to work a certain number of Saturdays a month from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. with no lunch break. And so she receives the, this job offer and she calls and she asks me, she says, why is there no lunch break? And I asked the employer and he said, well, you know, we can't close down for an hour. We don't have anybody else that can come in for an hour. So we're expecting this person to work from 9 a.m. to 6. And I said, well, close the practice for an hour. You know, how's that going to hurt the business for one hour to be closed? But just things like that, I see that quite often where there's just this disconnect with the employer where they're expecting somebody to do something that just seems, you know, unreasonable. And I think that that's why sometimes people feel the way that they they feel because they're in a situation where, you know, it makes them unhappy. So either they can deal with it or at some point they're going to get, you know, frustrated enough um, where they're going to leave. And I think it's things like that, that on the employer side, if you can just close down for an hour, give this person a lunch break, they're going to be a happier employee. It's going to be a better culture. They're going to stay long term. But unfortunately, you know, not all employers um, will make those changes. Yeah, I agree, Stacy, And I think that from my experience, because I've already, you know, just being three and a half years out, have worked at multiple different practices. And some of the owners, I just feel like, well, they have this mentality that this is the way we've always done it. And this is the way our business runs. So this is the way we're going to continue to do it. And that's where I think it's just this lack of creativity or lack of wanting to try something different because being creative or trying something new, unfortunately, does entail potentially failing at it or it going terribly wrong. And as type A personalities, for the most part, we're not particularly enthralled with the idea of failure. So I think the other thing is just accepting and giving ourselves the permission. I mean, it's easier said than done to try new things. And I think just trying to find those practices where the owners are more receptive and more willing to try things, at least be open to it, is important for me anyway. Because there are days where I can work without a lunch break if I can eat in between, but I can't do that every day. And 
like if I did that five days in a row, I just would be burnt out. And I, that's comes with knowing myself and some other people might not need that much food. I don't know. Or <laughs> a break. <laughs> I, I need to look and you know, and I've, I've so, done a lot of research and studying on work. Breaking up a little bit, so, Stacey. Well, sometimes you just need 10 minutes to clear your head, and then it makes you more productive. It's not necessarily just, uh, you know, I need to eat things. Uh, I have two, two, yeah. two things here to, to bunch in with real fast. Um, we have one question from Alexandra, um, and she was wondering, and Halal, you're the perfect person to, to give her some advice on this. Has anyone explored options completely outside veterinary medicine, you know, where our skills fit in with other types of things I know you've considered. And so I, I will jump in here, I, sorry, um, because I worked as a CPA and honestly what compelled me to leave that profession was the fact that I, I felt constantly like I wasn't contributing anything to society. I wasn't doing any meaningful work. So while Liquid medicine is hard and stressful and ethical and you're dealing with patients' lives and difficult clients, um, you at least are doing something meaningful. So that kind of resonates with me. Yeah, definitely. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I agree. And Alex, when, sorry, I'm just calling you Alex. I don't know if that's okay. Okay. But. <laughs> um, when I first moved from Hawaii to Colorado, I was on a wait for my license, for my vet license, which at first I was really upset about that I didn't get my license right away to practice, but it took about four months, four to five months for me to get my license, and in between I applied for all these other jobs, and I was like, well, I guess I'll just do something else then in the meanwhile. And plus, I was kind of interested in exploring other job options too. So I definitely think it's important not to be closed off to that idea because like, I just wanna read this quote before, um, by Stephen Colbert that I love. And he says, um, thankfully dreams can change. Sorry, I'm trying to find it right now. Uh, I lost it. <laughs> I love this quote. I'm so glad you're sharing it. This one. Yeah. So um, he said, thankfully, dreams can change. If we'd all stuck with our first dream, the world would be overrun with cowboys and princesses. <laughs> and I just love that quote because I just feel like, uh, so what I did was I actually signed up on a app called Rover. I don't know if you've heard of it. I don't know if they have it in England or. No, I'm just saying, uh, <laughs> But ready. Okay. Sorry. Something before we try and get this to go away. I, I, uh, Peter, is that you? I think we may have you. Are you Are you on with us? Uh, momentarily. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so I don't know what's going on with Peter, but just real quickly, I'll say that I did sign up on this Rover app, which is a dog walking and dog sitting app which was really fun. I actually loved it. And I just went to people's houses and pet sit for them. Or, and it was great because I marketed myself as a veterinarian. So I just got inundated with, I finally had to be like, no, I can't come because so many people were asking me because I have the experience with animals, especially the really old ones that need to be medicated. And so that's just one avenue because I'm like, hey, where are my skills? Okay, I'm good with animals. So why don't I just go do something like that. I even applied for jobs at museums, but they never called me back. And then I got my vet license. <laughs> I think I was overqualified, but I just thought it would be great to work at the art museum or something like that. So anyway, that's my answer to your question, Alex. I think it's definitely worthwhile investigating because um, the clinics will always be there and you can always come back to it. So I am I have a question for everyone because I feel like we have spoken about the stress in the industry and how hard we work and the ethical dilemmas, but we haven't really addressed the elephant in the room, uh, which is compensation. So my first question is, you know, I, generally speaking, I think veterinarians are grossly underpaid for what they do and the hours they work and the amount of education that they have. Uh, most notably, in Colorado, where veterinarians are being paid a third less than the national average. So I'm curious, 
you know, what the group thinks about compensation and why it is where it is and how we can move that forward that it's at a more reasonable level for veterinarians to survive. That's a really good question, um, Joy. And I don't mean to hop in here on Nicola, but I think that we have some mm -hmm. really great perspectives on this. So I want to make sure that um, Dr. Diane Agner is on here and she's been a practice owner. So sorry to Diane to call you out on that, but. That means you got to unmute. There she goes. Woo! Diane made a comment earlier too that, that owners have stress too, right? And often misunderstood. And I think the area of compensation is one of those areas perhaps. So we do have a really interesting perspective. And then again, um, Stacy, you can probably weigh in too from, from yours, as well as everybody else. But like, Ooh, we have some really great people to weigh in on that particular question, Joy. So um, hop on in, Diane. Well, you know, I, I just, um, you know, I sold my practice a couple years ago, and I sold it really because it wasn't serving me anymore. And largely, it was what everybody hears about, which is the human resource issues, personnel issues. The medicine still excites me, so much so that I've gotten certified in hospice and palliative care in my early 60s, and I'm starting a small concierge end-of-life practice here at the Jersey Shore. But I vow that I'll never have another employee. Um, and the saddest thing about my sale of my practice was that though I ended up, I think, getting pretty good value from my practice, the relationship I had with my long-term associate, who I'd mentored since she was 12 years old, totally imploded. Um, and, um, and she didn't see, you know, like, although she's the one that chose not to buy my practice, she saw that I took an opportunity away from her. And this business that I had worked hard for for 30 or four years was not taken away from me because I sold it. But um, we, as owners, there are things that aren't satisfying as well for us that can leave us to... Um, need a change. And I, I, I'm not taking away. I understand that, that I had way more control than a typical associate would have and able to create an experience for myself that was largely professionally very satisfying, way more than the typical associate. Mm -hmm. But I think that we don't often talk about the owners, too, that are frequently misunderstood. Um, and, um, and, and, and just the fact that they're, they're unfortunately is the situation where communications aren't always what they should be and um, you know, conflict resolution skills aren't what they should be. So I, I just thought I'd mention that because I think sometimes the conversation is very one-sided from the associate's perspective. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with that. And I do think that unless you, I mean, I ran my own business on Maui for a little bit after I just did mostly home euthanasias and, um, just, but I spoke with a lot of practice owners and I do agree. I think that there's so much that we don't understand of what goes into running a practice. And I looked into running my own practice too and opening my own. And I just was like, oh, hell no, if I'm not going to do this right now, because after I did all the research and found out all this information about, you know, even what it takes to hire an employee alone. Um, yeah, I agree. I think that that's why it's important to know yourself and know what you can handle and what you can't handle because a lot, some people can tolerate, like you said, maybe conflict resolution isn't what it should be, but if it's something you feel like, okay, well, most days this is better than, you know. I think what you said, that, that, that resonates the most with me is just really learning to know about yourself, right? Yeah. You know, here I am after selling my practice and having a reasonably successful practice for many years, I still sort of feel like a failure because I wasn't an owner of a much larger practice. But, but my practice was the right size for me. And you know, in a bigger practice would not have been the right size for me. So I love the fact that you're already figuring that out at an early stage of your career. Because I think that that's the thing that I hope most um, younger and newly graduating veterinarians understand that it's really about figuring out what's a good fit for you. You know, what serves you? Yeah, I agree totally. And it's interesting. Sorry, Brenda, I know you're yeah, yeah. Um, But like one of the things that I love about learning about myself is, you know, just it took me a long time to give myself permission to do that. And the Vet Confessionals project has been huge with helping me even and I'm the one who started it. But one of the things someone mentioned on there about practice ownership was 
they were like, well, I just hate how like the pinnacle of success in veterinary medicine is owning your own practice. Like that's what we all have to strive for. And it's just interesting, Diane, hearing you say that even though you did all those things, you still felt like you were a failure because it wasn't big enough. You know, it's like, where does it end? So it really, because it was a secret about a relief doctor who ended up opening her own practice. And she was saying, oh, I was so much happier as a relief doctor. But my mom said in order to be successful, I should open my own practice. And it's like, but that wasn't the right thing for her. So she ended up not being happy. And I agree, Diane. It's just mostly like learning about yourself. So we've got, just, it, that's, that's two more minutes. minutes. I, want, I would love to let Stacy weigh in just a little bit on this conversation. Then we have another question that I want to be sure we get put out there, but in the interest of everybody's time, let's, so let's try to like say another five minutes or so. And then, um, and then move, even though we, we could be talking about this for hours, this is where we need I a, know, it like never or a couple glasses of wine. Right. And <laughs> it around the table. Yeah. Stacy, um, did you have a comment you'd like to add to the whole conversation going on here? Yeah, it's about the veterinary compensation because it is going up. Um, because of the supply and demand issues, since there is one veterinarian for every five jobs open in veterinary practice, the compensation packages are going up. And in fact, you know, I just got back from the Veterinary Innovation Summit. Brenda, Catherine, you were there. And one of the speakers said that he went to LSU and saw several of the new graduates' job offers, and they were in the six figures. They were 100,000, you know, guarantees for the first year. That's what I'm seeing. Here in our search practice, I have seen um, veterinarians that are graduating this May with offers ranging between 100 and 120 base. Um, and when I share that with different owners around the country, they, they can't believe it, um, but I've seen it, um, it's, it's happening. And so if somebody has you know, been out for a long time and they're making 50 or 65,000, you know, this is the time to start looking for something different because there's been no better job market in the last 20 years of veterinary medicine than today. So if somebody is not happy with their compensation, this is the time to look for something different. That's a fabulous comment, um, Stacey, and like a very uplifting, I think, for everybody to hear too, for all those years of college and you get overworked and underpaid. So, okay, I hate to do this to us, but I'm gonna ask this one last question. Uh, Nine Tara had a question about her experience, and I think while well, you can give her some good guidance and everyone else, please offer up too. Her question was, if you've been in a bad practice, would you want to warn other veterinarians away from going to work there? You know, not to be vindictive, but just to share that information because um, there's a responsibility to the profession to, you know, to make others aware, to deliver good work, and to help others get into good circumstances. So, um, um, yeah, I think that's a really great question because I thought about that too. But then I realized, honestly, like, unless someone directly asked me, is this a good place to work? I probably wouldn't go out of my way to, you know, try and say, oh, this practice is terrible. Just because I don't know the next person coming in, if they're going to be the right person who's capable of whatever that practice needs, like maybe they're going to be the right fit. And how do I know that that person isn't going to be the right fit? Like all I know is what I feel and what I experience, And that doesn't necessarily mean that like the next person is going to experience that. So personally, I would probably, unless I was directly asked, like someone directly reached out to me to say, Hey, you worked here. What did you think? If that happened, then I would give my opinion, but I wouldn't go out of my way to say, this is the worst place ever, you know, because that was my experience and that may not necessarily be the next person's experience. And then well, and I think the key word there was opinion too, because I don't think it's necessarily a fact because I can interview people that, you know, pick any company or employer in the animal health or veterinary industry. And I could talk to somebody that, did not like working there. And I can talk to somebody that would say it was the best job they ever had. Um, yeah, because everyone's background is different and what they're capable of handling is different. And like I said, all these experiences in the end do shape us. Like I realize now the work I did was preparing me for relief work. So, and now I'm, I feel like gonna be really happy with it. So, you know, it's hindsight's twenty twenty. And in terms of the compensation, yeah, sorry, I didn't answer that question. Um, the other thing was when I was working at that 24-hour practice, 
in Maui, I felt the compensation was just terrible because I was on straight production, um, 23%. Of, and there were some nights, basically, if people didn't pay for the emergency, I didn't get But now doing relief, I'm way happier with the compensation. Um, so if that's any insight into this has been a really tremendous conversation. I wish we could carry on for a really long time, but it's getting late in a couple parts of the world. Um, and early in others. <laughs> time to wake up in other parts of the world as well. But um, Halal, I mean, fabulous comments that you shared with us all and great questions from those of you who joined us too. So um, we're going to end this with a cheers and we hope to see you on another Bridge Club soon. So thank you, Brenda. And thank you, Catherine. And thanks for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, guys. Thank you. And now you can all, there you go. Yeah. All right. Should I sign off or? No, stay on for one second. We'll see if. Uh...